All right, welcome back to the 30-hour post-licensing course. Remember, I'm Raymond Modulin. If you have questions, feel free to email me, raymond at realuniversity.com. Uh, we are currently in lesson number three. We're dealing with contracts, and we're trying to go through some of the basic information so that you can understand and obviously become successful in your career. And currently, we are going to talk a little bit about the legal capacity of the parties of this contract. Now, I told you earlier, there is a term called, they must have what is called the capacity to contract, meaning two things. They have to be of sufficient age and they have to be of sufficient middle capacity. So let's talk about these two items and how they uh, interact in a contract. Now, remember, I am not a practicing attorney, so do not construe this as legal advice. If you have a specific situation that arises, you probably should seek out your own attorney for specific situations. So here on the screen, we've got uh, lesson number three. And when I see this picture, the only thing I can think of all the time is, you know, to draw that. That makes me feel a little bit better. But <clears throat> a person's capacity to contract one of the things, the very first thing we talk about is the age of 18. That is the majority age in all states, that that is the age that is required for a, uh, an adult to become competent enough to sign a contract. Ironically, anybody under the age of 18, you hear the legal term calling an infant. They are an infant, so even... 14, 15, 16 year olds. <clears throat> they can also be legally emancipated by a court that would give them the age of majority if they were like 17, for example. <clears throat> now there is a few things that minors under the age of 18 can sign for. And they are usually deemed as what they call essential or necessary items. So like food, medical service, medication, emergency services, like at an emergency room. All, and a minor can sign those contracts because those could be deemed essential or necessary in the form of, hey, I gotta have the medicine, he's under 17, let's treat him, and they can sign that, okay? Now, when it comes to the age of majority, if they sign a contract under the age of majority, they can then ratify or reaffirm that contract once they become 18. If they are a minor when they enter into the contract, they can actually void that contract because it would be voidable. It would not automatically, and we're back to my pet peeve, the word between void and voidable is different. So once they are of age of majority, they could reaffirm. So let me give you an example. For instance, Jane, 17 years old, goes into a local gym, signs up for a contract at 17. Now, this is not what would be deemed a necessity or an essential item. It's not food, it's not medicine, it's not medical attention. So this is a luxury by definition. If Jane decided that she did not want to continue with that contract, she could actually void that contract and go in and have it undone until she becomes the age of 18, at which time it would then automatically become valid and she would ratify it. Now, if she decides to have it undone, the one key part to this that you have to understand, she still has to pay what she has used. So if she went one month, didn't make the payment, decides she wants to void the contract, go in, claim, hey, I'm underage, I want this contract undone, she could do that, she would still owe that service that she used, okay? So that's how a minor 
can either ratify or reaffirm a contract if they sign it when they're younger. Now there is another, another term that means they have to be sufficiently mental capacity to understand the ramifications of the outcome. All right? They cannot be what is called adjudicated insane, meaning that the court has declared that they are insane. If that happens, they can never enter into any valid contract. The second they sign something, it's void because it's not, uh, uh, it's defective, all right? So it cannot be valid at any given time during that process. There are certain situations where someone may have impaired mental capacity and that has actually been shown in court cases and you can search these. Now we had this happen in our brokerage back in about February of 2020 where a seller literally came in and was so hammered that the title company would not close the deal. They claimed that he was mentally impaired and therefore was, could have voided the contract by claiming mental impairment and said, hey, I don't remember doing that. Now, I will tell you that most courts will gen generally rule that someone who was voluntarily in an altered state, high on drugs, drunk, things of that nature, are very seldom, if ever, allowed to claim that impairment as the reason to get out of the deal. The court looks at that like it was a self-impairment. It was a decision that was made upon that person. Now they are choosing to use that as a method to get out. Nonetheless, the title company decided they were not, in fact, going to close the deal. There is an exception to that mental impairment, and that would be is if the other party is obviously trying to take advantage of that mental impairment, then yes, it would be, all right? Good example for that would be, let's say a buddy of yours, you get really stinking drunk and you decide you ask a buddy to take you home, um, and you're going to give him your Rolex watch to do that. Or your buddy asks for the Rolex watch. That would be a situation of a person who was actually taken advantage of during their mental incapacity. That could legally say, hey, even though I was self-impaired, that guy sought out that advantage to take it from me. So that could be a situation where the judge would go, okay, yeah, you need to give the Rolex back. Let's go back to that mentally incompetent. I had a, a little thing here I wanted to talk about. If a person's mentally incompetent, they generally lack the ability to enter into a contract. If it's a temporary, like maybe bipolar or some stress-related item or something of that, they could, in fact, reaffirm that contract once they regain the capacity to understand or they could disaffirm it. If they are permanently incapacitated, like I mentioned earlier, if they are adjudicated insane and they are permanently deemed as incapable of understanding, then they can never sign a contract. It would be void from the outset and or they could have a legal guardian void it for them because they did not have the mental capacity. All right, so that's a little bit about the capacity to contract where a person must have lucid thoughts during that time frame. And we always joke about, oh, IU grad, Purdue grad, but really there is some situations of, you know, elderly people signing listing contracts or people coming into the closing that are hammered. All of these situations you need to keep in your mind because you certainly don't want to get down the road two or three days or a week or a month and find out that something that you have done is now going to be undone because a person is claiming 
some kind of incompetence, all right? So we're done with this section, but we're not done with contracts by any means, so we're going to motor on. Hold on a second. <laughs>